I have a lot of scary things that have happened in my life, probably more than my fair share. By the way, this is my first Reddit post, so I'm sorry if it sucks. When I was a child, I was nearly kidnapped three separate times. I only remember one of them, but my family has two other times that they say happened which I will briefly go over. One of these times was at a barrel racing competition in Camp Verde, Arizona, a lady picked me up as an infant and tried to run away with me, but my dad chased her and she put me down. Another time someone else tried to break into our car when my mom left me inside for a moment to drop the mail at the post office, apparently even as a little kid I had the presence of mind to honk the horn until she came out and the guy left. Again, I don't remember these specific instances, and you know as much as I do now. The one time I do remember, I was a little bit older, and my brother and his best friend were there too. My mom owned a restaurant and we would go to Costco to buy tons of wholesale food in one stop and she would bring us along mostly because she didn't want to pay a babysitter, but also because we were cheap labor and would load and unload the car in exchange for chicken fingers, or Costco pizza. This time, my brother, his friend and I opted to get paid up front and had Costco pizza while my mom went around the store and got everything on her list. We ate our food and before we went to look for our mom, went into the bathroom. There were three stalls, and my brother and his friend were on either side with me in between them. I think I was singing while I sat on the toilet, and didn't notice when someone else came in. I don't remember much about what he looked like, other than that he had a denim jacket and I think he had a skinny clean shaven face. I know this much because he looked under the stall door right at me. I was scared and stopped making noise, and my brother asked if I was okay, and the guy stopped looking at me and disappeared. Nothing happened for a minute, and then suddenly the man's arm reached under and grabbed my pants which were around my ankles. He tried to drag me out under the door, but I screamed and put my hands under both sides of the stall and my brother and his friend grabbed them and held on to me. I think my brother yelled at the guy and we were all screaming, and they kept pulling me until the guy let go and we heard him run out of the bathroom. We tried to run out and get a look at him but he was gone. When we told my mom she went to the Costco people to see if they had surveillance tapes, but they said the police needed to be involved and warrants and stuff needed to be gotten. We ended up just going home. It was one of the scariest things that has ever happened to me, and I think it still affects me today. I sleep with my bedroom door locked, and have nightmares about home intruders pretty often. This happened at the Costco in Flagstaff, Arizona, probably somewhere between 1999 and 2001, and I've always wondered if something else like it has ever happened in that area, or if someone was ever caught for kidnapping in that area around that time. I was hoping putting this on Reddit might stir something up. If it doesn't though, that's okay. I just hope we never meet again. My husband is dying. Despite his good prognosis after the accident, he gets weaker every day. After he couldn't even say my name, I got desperate. I posted details of his condition on every forum I could find. Medical, accident survivors. I even posted it on a sketchy, deep web forum called Help Yourself. That's where I got the PM from Chris. I can help you. I'll send instructions tomorrow morning. The next morning, I didn't get a PM. I got a letter. A real, paper envelope, tucked into my empty mailbox. After I got over the initial terror, he somehow knows where I live, I greedily opened it and read the note inside. Dear Blair. Here are the instructions. Be sure to follow them exactly, or they might find you. Then we'll have a real problem on our hands. Drive to the Costco in my city. Bring a photograph of your husband and something that is likely to have his DNA on it, like a toothbrush. Go to the refrigerated produce room in the back. You will see a red-haired woman standing there, pretending to sort through the lettuce. She will be wearing a red vest and a Costco badge, but don't be fooled. She is not an employee. Go up to her and ask, do you have organic blueberries? My son's allergic to the other kind. As long as the produce section is empty, she will smile and lead you over to the blueberries. As she picks up a box and hands it to you, she will purposefully drop it. Oh no! She'll pretend it's an accident. Play along. Such a mess. Blueberries all over the floor. She'll say, I'll stand out there and make sure no one comes in while we wait for the janitor. No janitor is coming, of course. She will stand guard outside the produce room. Go to the right wall, where the crate of mushrooms is. Push it back towards the wall, it will roll into a small alcove. Beneath it, you will see a rectangular hole cut into the floor, 
and a ladder leading down. Climb down it. My eyes flicked to the bottom, where he had scrawled in red marker, warning. Read before proceeding. Don't just make a beeline for the produce section. They'll know what you're doing. Get a cart, fill it with some junk. You should blend in with the other shoppers as much as possible. For that same reason, don't wear bright colors or heavy makeup. If a short woman with an infant strapped to her chest asks you for help, kindly refuse. She is one of them. If you look closely, you will notice that the infant pressed face first into her chest is a doll. Don't talk to the man at the front of the store advertising flooring. He's not one of them, he's just rude. Don't buy any food from the cafe. I folded up the paper and jammed it into my pocket. Then I rushed into the house, grabbed the items he requested, and jumped in the car. With a squeal of tires, I was on my way. It had been a decade since I last set foot in a Costco. Everything looked different. Bigger. Emptier. The shelves stretched up to the ceiling far above, a seasonal section of glittering Christmas trees and dancing Santas sat far below. I rolled the cart into one of the first aisles. Napkins and disposable dining ware stared back at me. I grabbed a huge stack of paper plates and dropped it into my cart. Throng, the metal rattled. When I got to the end of the aisle, I turned left. Excuse me. I turned around. A pretty blonde woman stood behind me. Yeah. She flashed me a sweet smile. I don't want to bother you, but can you help me get that? She pointed to a jug of maple syrup on a high shelf. I can't reach it. And you're so tall. I stared at her, my heart beginning to pound. My eyes flicked down. A motionless infant was strapped to her chest. No, I'm sorry, I'm in a hurry. But. I quickened my pace. The cart rolled across the floor with newfound speed. I didn't slow until I'd rounded the corner. Then I grabbed a few more decoy items, some corn muffins from the bakery, a bag of clementines, and arrived at the produce room. When I entered, there she was. The red-haired woman, sorting through the lettuce. I cleared my throat. Ah. Uh, do you have organic blueberries? My sons. Ah. Uh, he can't eat them. I mean, he's allergic to the other kind. Fuck. She gave me a smile and walked over to the blueberries. They're right over here. She picked up one of the boxes. Splat. I watched her walk out. When she was firmly stationed at the entrance, I ran over to the crate of mushrooms. I gave it a push. It rolled easily under my hands. With a final glance at the red-haired woman, I descended into the pit. The metal rungs were cold under my hands. They felt rough, as if covered in rust. The square of light above me shrunk, until it was little more than a twinkling star in a black sky. Smack. My feet hit the hard floor. Drip, drip, drip. The sound of water came from somewhere in the darkness, along with a soft rustling sound. I pulled my phone out and turned on the flashlight. Before me was a tunnel, roughly hewn out of stone, like some strange hybrid between a basement and a cave. I walked forward. The floor was uneven, and I had to concentrate to keep my footing. The damp walls glistened in the white light. After a few minutes, I found a wooden door set into the stone. I pulled it open. Inside was a dark, cavernous room. The smooth walls and rectangular shape looked like a traditional basement, but it had a rotten, swamp-like stench to it. In the center was a table. One leg was bent and broken. There was a sheet of paper in the middle. It said. Leave the items here. We'll take care of the rest. I pulled the toothbrush and photo out of my pocket. I placed them on the table. I looked around the room, but as far as I could tell, it was empty. The closest thing to a person was a heap of clothes in the back corner. My heart filled with doubt, but I tried to focus on Dan and the happy life we deserved as I exited the basement. Dan came home from the hospital two days later. That first night home, we sat on the couch in front of the TV, eating ice cream. Like nothing had happened. Guess I'm living on borrowed time, Dan said, though a mouthful of cookies and cream. Better make it count. By eating tons of ice cream. By leading a good life. Oh. He smiled at me. I reached out for his hand, squeezed it, and smiled back. But our smiles faded when the news came on. 
the newscaster was standing outside of Costco. Dozens of police cars were parked around it, their red and blue lights cutting through the night. Tonight, police found evidence of violent cult activity at the Costco, she began. I jabbed nervously at my ice cream. Human remains, belonging to dozens of individuals, were found in the basement. They ranged from a few days to a few years old. Police believe some matched the missing locals, but were waiting on forensics to answer. The most recent one, however, has already been identified, it belongs to 24-year-old Carly Bessinger. A photograph flashed up on the screen. Blonde hair, blue eyes, a warm smile. It was her. The blonde woman who asked me to reach something on the shelf. Security footage shows her walking around the store two days ago, alive and well. Until she entered the produce section. The reporter's voice faded. I wasn't listening anymore. Chris lied. There were no them. No woman with a doll strapped to her chest, waiting to pounce on me. No evil entity watching, thinking, plotting. He just didn't want me talking to a witness. A victim. A sacrifice. I looked over at Dan. He watched, oblivious, a generic look of concern spread over his features. I looked down at the floor, unable to watch anymore. Dan's not on borrowed time. He's on stolen time. I got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. When I returned, I found myself still asleep in bed. I stood at the bedside deciding if the thing in my place was me or something else. It looked like me. She was wearing the same t-shirt I was wearing. Her breath was the slow and deep breath of a sleeper. Maybe I was the thing, and she was me. Her eyes shot wide open. Her gaze fixed on me as if she had already been staring directly at me before she lifted her eyelids. Five pounding heartbeats of silence. I started to cry. Her face, my face, wore an expression mine never does. Contempt. Rage. She rose from the bed. Our bodies lined up perfectly, her eyes locked with mine. The tips of our noses almost touched. I could feel her breath on my lips. She said, Periidolia. Then she kissed me. I had finally met the coincidence man. It's hard to recognize the coincidence man when you see him for the first time. It's easy to rationalize the experience of meeting him as a simple matter of chance. I met him two days ago. A pair of takeaway cup lids lay on the sidewalk, litter that blew out of a nearby overfilled trash can. They sat near a crescent-shaped puddle, creating a rough image of their face. A face with eyes perched off-center of an irregular, obnoxiously smiling mouth. What are you so happy about? I playfully asked it as I stepped in the puddle. The water sloshed about, creating a distorted reflection of my own face. For an instant my reflection twisted into the same shape as the pair of cup lids and the puddle. No nose. My eyes off-center and my mouth twisted in a lunatic grin. That was the moment I ruined my life. I just didn't know it yet. I saw the coincidence man again inside the store. Two oranges sat, misplaced, on a pile of avocados. A banana had fallen out of the upper fruit bin into the avocados. The fruit formed a smiling face with orange eyes and a smirking banana mouth. Its orange eyes followed me as I wandered through the produce section of the food store. I finished my shopping and got on with my life. What was left of it? The coincidence man followed me. I saw him again and again. A smirking spaghetti mouth and tomato sauce eyes on the kitchen floor when I tripped carrying my pasta. A manic winking grin made by my socks and underwear in the laundry basket. Two donuts and a frown made of a handful of coffee stirrers in the break room at work. The wheels of a bicycle and a screaming mouth made by a coiled garden hose on the lawn in front of my apartment. He even followed me into the bathroom when I showered. Two toilet paper roll eyes sat on top of the toilet. The bowl made an overexcited mouth. 
the toilet brush my roommate left in front of the toilet proved that the entity following me was indeed a man. I kicked the brush into the corner. Stop following me, perv. He didn't stop following me. Yesterday he was everywhere. Everywhere I looked, I saw a smiling face. It's just a coincidence, I kept telling myself. My brain, I thought, was just in a weird mode. All you need to see a face is two rough circles for eyes and something longish or roundish underneath to represent a mouth. Such a simple pattern was bound to show up everywhere, just by chance. Right? The coincidence man showed me how wrong I was. I tripped on the curb leaving my apartment. I fell, scraping my palms badly. The contusion on my right palm was a work of art. It was a stylized sketch of a man's face. The face of a man, stern and focused, staring right at me like a beardless Che Guevara rendered in blood on my palms. What do you want? I screamed at my bloody hand. The inscrutable face stared back. He showed up again at lunch, in the pattern of chocolate chips baked into the cookie I got from the cafeteria. Two chocolate chip eyes sat above a diabolical smile formed by a line of melted chocolate. Enjoy being eaten. I said. Then I ate it. That seemed to solve the problem. For the rest of the day, there were no more faces staring at me from any direction I happened to look. I woke up in the middle of the night. The coincidence man was waiting for me when I returned to my bed. He stood in front of me and said the word, periidolia. He kissed me. I melted into the kiss. Warm darkness flowed over me and I flowed into the darkness. That's what the sensation of existence ending feels like. I'm him now. I'm the coincidence man. Or lady. It doesn't matter. I'm neither man nor woman. I'm not human. I'm not even really alive. I am a creature of periidolia. Periidolia is a word. It refers to the tendency to see patterns, such as faces, in random data. Every time you see me, it seems like it's just a coincidence. Just your mind imagining a pattern where there isn't one. Except it isn't a coincidence. I become conscious only when someone sees a face in random data. Eyes and a mouth in an electrical socket. A funny arrangement of knobs and handles on a dresser drawer. The way two spare tires lean against a building with a rolled-up tarp in front of them. I exist only when someone experiences periidolia. Their recognition of a face blinks my consciousness into existence, and I experience the world as if the imagined face was my own. There is incredible pain. A child saw a face in scattered Lego bricks on a table, and suddenly I existed looking up at the child through my plastic brick eyes. The child grabbed the wheel that was my right eye, and I felt my eye get ripped out of its place in my face. The child grabbed my long brick mouth and I felt the lower part of my face be torn away. With only one brick left, the child's imagination no longer saw a face, and I blinked out of existence. Today, a mobile phone lay on an office desk. Two coffee mugs placed next to the phone gave a passerby the impression of a face, and now I exist again for a few minutes. My coffee mug eyes are stuck facing the white drop tile ceiling. I screamed for help. I always scream for help. But no sound ever comes from the inanimate objects that are perceived as my mouth. But this time it's different. I have a mobile phone for a month. My thoughts of speech, my screams for help, aren't heard by anyone, but they somehow activate the phone's speech recognition. I don't know where my words are going, that depends on whatever the owner of the phone was doing before they put it down. This is my story so far. But it is not the end. There is a way out. If someone talks to me, like I talk to the coincidence man in the puddle, then I can latch onto them. I can make them see faces around them, and watch them through those faces. And if they eat me, like I ate the cookie with a face, then I can become them, just like the coincidence man became me. And they will fall into the eternal limbo of periidolia and I will be set free.
I saw him on a sleepless night when I was walking desperately to save my soul and my vision. My coming to New York had been a mistake, for whereas I had looked for poignant wonder and inspiration in the teeming labyrinths of ancient streets that twist endlessly from forgotten courts and squares and waterfronts to courts and squares and waterfronts equally forgotten, and in the cyclopean modern towers and pinnacles that rise blackly Babylonian under waning moons, I had found instead only a sense of horror and oppression which threatened to master, paralyze, and annihilate me. The disillusion had been gradual. Coming for the first time upon the town, I had seen it in the sunset from a bridge, majestic above its waters, its incredible peaks and pyramids rising flower-like and delicate from pools of violet mist to play with the flaming golden clouds and the first stars of evening. Then it had lighted up window by window above the shimmering tides where lanterns nodded and glided and deep horns bade weird harmonies, and had itself become a starry firmament of dream, redolent of fairy music, and one with the marvels of Carcassonne and Samarkand and El Dorado and all glorious and half-fabulous cities. Shortly afterward I was taken through those antique ways so dear to my fancy narrow, curving alleys and passages where rows of red Georgian brick blinked with small pane dormers above pillared doorways that had looked on gilded sedans and paneled coaches and in the first flush of realization of these long-wished things I thought I had indeed achieved such treasures as would make me in time a poet. But success and happiness were not to be. Garish daylight showed only squalor and alienage and the noxious elephantiasis of climbing, spreading stone where the moon had hinted of loveliness and elder magic, and the throngs of people that seethed through the flume-like streets were squat, swarthy strangers with hardened faces and narrow eyes, shrewd strangers without dreams and without kinship to the scenes about them, who could never mean aught to a blue-eyed man of the old folk with the love of fair green lanes and white New England. Village steeples in his heart. So instead of the poems I had hoped for, there came only a shuddering blankness and ineffable loneliness, and I saw at last a fearful truth which no one had ever dared to breathe before the unwhisperable secret of secrets the fact that this city of stone and strider is not a sentient perpetuation of old New York as London is of old London and Paris of old Paris, but that it is in fact quite dead its sprawling body imperfectly embalmed and infested with queer animate things which have nothing to do with it as it was in life. Upon making this discovery I ceased to sleep comfortably, though something of resigned tranquility came back as I gradually formed the habit of keeping off the streets by day and venturing abroad only at night, when darkness calls forth what little of the past still hovers wraith-like about, and old white doorways remember the stalwart forms that once passed through them. With this mode of relief I even wrote a few poems, and still refrain from going home to my people lest I seem to crawl back ignobly in defeat. Then, on a sleepless night's walk, I met the man. It was in a grotesque hidden courtyard of the Greenwich section, for there in my ignorance I had settled, having heard of the place as the natural home of poets and artists. The archaic lanes and houses and unexpected bits of square and court had indeed delighted me, and when I found the poets and artists to be loud-voiced pretenders whose quaintness is tinsel and whose lives are a denial of all that pure beauty which is poetry and art, I stayed on for love of these venerable things. I fancied them as they were in their prime, when Greenwich was a placid village not yet engulfed by the town, and in the hours before dawn, when all the revellers had slunk away, I used to wander alone among their cryptical windings and brood upon the curious arcana which generations must have deposited there. This kept my soul alive, and gave me a few of those dreams and visions for which the poet far within me cried out. The man came upon me at about two one cloudy August morning, as I was threading a series of detached courtyards, now accessible only through the unlighted hallways of intervening buildings, but once forming parts of a continuous network of picturesque alleys. I had heard of them by vague rumor, and realized that they could not be upon any map of today but the fact that they were forgotten only endeared them to me, so that I had sought them with twice my usual eagerness. Now that I had found them, my eagerness was again redoubled, for something in their arrangement dimly hinted that they might be only a few of many such, with dark, dumb counterparts wedged obscurely betwixt high blank walls and deserted rear tenements or lurking lamplessly behind archways. Unbetrayed by hordes of the foreign-speaking or guarded by furtive and uncommunicative artists whose practices do not invite publicity or the light of day. He spoke to me without invitation, 
noting my mood and glances as I studied certain knocker doorways above iron-railed steps, the pallid glow of tracery transoms feebly lighting my face. His own face was in shadow, and he wore a wide-brimmed hat which somehow blended perfectly with the out-of-date cloak he affected, but I was subtly disquieted even before he addressed me. His form was very slight, thin almost to cadaverousness, and his voice proved phenomenally soft and hollow, though not particularly deep. He had, he said, noticed me several times at my wanderings, and inferred that I resembled him in loving the vestiges of former years. Would I not like the guidance of one long practiced in these explorations, and possessed of local information profoundly deeper than any which an obvious newcomer could possibly have gained? As he spoke, I caught a glimpse of his face in the yellow beam from a solitary attic window. It was a noble, even a handsome, elderly countenance, and bore the marks of a lineage and refinement unusual for the age and place. Yet some quality about it disturbed me almost as much as its features pleased me perhaps it was too white, or too expressionless, or too much out of keeping with the locality, to make me feel easy or comfortable. Nevertheless I followed him, for in those dreary days my quest for antique beauty and mystery was all that I had to keep my soul alive, and I reckon it a rare favor of fate to fall in with one whose kindred seekings seemed to have penetrated so much farther than mine. Something in the night constrained the cloaked man to silence, and for a long hour he led me forward without needless words, making only the briefest of comments concerning ancient names and dates and changes, and directing my progress very largely by gestures as we squeezed through interstices, tiptoed through corridors, clambered over brick walls, and once crawled on hands and knees through a low, arched passage of stone whose immense length and tortuous twistings effaced at last every hint of geographical location I had managed to preserve. The things we saw were very old and marvelous, or at least they seemed so in the few straggling rays of light by which I viewed them, and I shall never forget the tottering ionic columns and fluted pilasters and urn-headed iron fence-posts and flaring lintelled windows and decorative fanlights that appeared to grow quainter and stranger the deeper we advanced into this inexhaustible maze of unknown antiquity. We met no person, and as time passed the lighted windows became fewer and fewer. The streetlights we first encountered had been of oil, and of the ancient lozenge pattern. Later I noticed some with candles, and at last, after traversing a horrible unlighted court where my guide had to lead me with his gloved hand through total blackness to a narrow wooden gate in a high wall, we came upon a fragment of alley lit only by lanterns in front of every seventh house unbelievably colonial tin lanterns with conical tops and holes punched in the sides. This alley led steeply uphill more steeply than I had thought possible in this part of New York and the upper end was blocked squarely by the ivy-clad wall of a private estate, beyond which I could see a pale cupola, and the tops of trees waving against a vague lightness in the sky. In this wall was a small, low-arched gate of nail-studded black oak, which the man proceeded to unlock with a ponderous key. Leading me within, he steered a course in utter blackness over what seemed to be a gravel path, and finally up a flight of stone steps to the door of the house, which he unlocked and opened for me. We entered, and as we did so I grew faint from a reek of infinite mustiness which welled out to meet us, and which must have been the fruit of unwholesome centuries of decay. My host appeared not to notice this, and in courtesy I kept silent as he piloted me up a curving stairway, across a hall, and into a room whose door I heard him lock behind us. Then I saw him pull the curtains of the three small paned windows that barely showed themselves against the lightning sky, after which he crossed to the mantel, struck flint and steel, lighted two candles of a candelabrum of twelve sconces, and made a gesture enjoining soft tone speech. In this feeble radiance I saw that we were in a spacious, well-furnished and paneled library dating from the first quarter of the eighteenth century, with splendid doorway pediments, a delightful Doric cornice, and a magnificently carved over mantel with scroll and urn top. Above the crowded bookshelves at intervals along the walls were well-wrought family portraits, all tarnished to an enigmatical dimness, and bearing an unmistakable likeness to the man who now motioned me to a chair beside the graceful Chippendale table. Before seating himself across the table from me, my host paused for a moment as if in embarrassment, then, tardily removing his gloves, wide-brimmed hat, and cloak, stood theatrically revealed in full mid-Georgian costume from cued hair and neck ruffles to knee breeches, silk hose, 
and the buckled shoes I had not previously noticed. Now slowly sinking into a lyreback chair, he commenced to eye me intently. Without his hat he took on an aspect of extreme age which was scarcely visible before, and I wondered if this unperceived mark of singular longevity were not one of the sources of my original disquiet. When he spoke at length, his soft, hollow, and carefully muffled voice not infrequently quavered, and now and then I had great difficulty in following him as I listened with a thrill of amazement and half-disavowed alarm which grew each instant. You behold, sir, my host began, a man of very eccentrical habits, for whose costume no apology need be offered to one with your wit and inclinations. Reflecting upon better times, I have not scrupled to ascertain their ways and adopt their dress and manners, an indulgence which offends none if practiced without ostentation. It hath been my good fortune to retain the rural seat of my ancestors, swallowed though it was by two towns, first Greenwich, which built up hither after 1800, then New York, which joined on near 1830. There were many reasons for the close keeping of this place in my family, and I have not been remiss in discharging such obligations. The squire who succeeded to it in 1768 studied Sartain arts and made Sartain discoveries, all connected with influences residing in this particular plot of ground, and eminently deserving of the strongest guarding. Some curious effects of these arts and discoveries I now purpose to show you, under the strictest secrecy, and I believe I may rely on my judgment of men enough to have no distrust of either your interest or your fidelity. He paused, but I could only nod my head. I have said that I was alarmed, yet to my soul nothing was more deadly than the material daylight world of New York, and whether this man were a harmless eccentric or a wielder of dangerous arts I had no choice save to follow him and slake my sense of wonder on whatever he might have to offer. So I listened. To my ancestor, he softly continued, there appeared to reside some very remarkable qualities in the will of mankind, qualities having a little suspected dominance not only over the acts of oneself and of others, but over every variety of force and substance in nature, and over many elements and dimensions deemed more universal than nature herself. May I say that he flouted the sanctity of things as great as space and time and that he put to strange uses the rights of Sartain half-breed Red Indians once encamped upon this hill. These Indians showed collar when the place was built, and were plaguy pestilent in asking to visit the grounds at the full of the moon. For years they stole over the wall each month when they could, and by stealth performed Sartain acts. Then, in 68, the new squire catched them at their doings, and stood still at what he saw. Thereafter he bargained with them and exchanged the free access of his grounds for the exact inwardness of what they did, learning that their grandfathers got part of their custom from red ancestors and part from an old Dutchman in the time of the States General. And pox on him, I'm afeard the squire must have surveyed the monstrous bad rum weather or not by intent for a week after he learnt the secret he was the only man living that knew it. You, sir, are the first outsider to be told there is a secret, and split me if I'd have risked tampering that much with the powers had ye not been so hot after bygone things. I shuddered as the man grew colloquial and with the familiar speech of another day. He went on. But you must know, sir, that what the squire got from those mongrel salvages was but a small part of the learning he came to have. He had not been at Oxford for nothing, nor talked to no account with an ancient chymist and astrologer in Paris. He was, in fine, made sensible that all the world is but the smoke of our intellects, past the bidding of the vulgar, but by the wise to be puffed out and drawn in like any cloud of prime Virginia tobacco. What we want, we may make about us, and what we don't want, we may sweep away. I won't say that all this is wholly true in body, but, tis sufficient true to furnish a very pretty spectacle now and then. You, I conceive, would be tickled by a better sight of Sartain other years than your fancy affords you, so be pleased to hold back any fright at what I design to show. Come to the window and be quiet. My host now took my hand to draw me to one of the two windows on the long side of the malodorous room, and at the first touch of his unloved fingers I turned cold. His flesh, though dry and firm, was of the quality of ice, and I almost shrank away from his pulling. But again I thought of the emptiness and horror of reality, and boldly prepared to follow whithersoever I might be led. Once at the window, 
the man drew apart the yellow silk curtains and directed my stare into the blackness outside. For a moment I saw nothing save a myriad of tiny dancing lights, far, far before me. Then, as if in response to an insidious motion of my host's hand, a flash of heat lightning played over the scene, and I looked out upon a sea of luxuriant foliage foliage unpolluted, and not the sea of roofs to be expected by any normal mind. On my right the Hudson glittered wickedly, and in the distance ahead I saw the unhealthy shimmer of a vast salt marsh constellated with nervous fireflies. The flash died, and an evil smile illumined the waxy face of the aged necromancer. That was before my time before the new squire's time. Pray let us try again. I was faint, even fainter than the hateful modernity of that accursed city had made me. Good God! I whispered, can you do that for any time? And as he nodded, and bared the black stumps of what had once been yellow fangs, I clutched at the curtains to prevent myself from falling. But he steadied me with that terrible, ice-cold claw, and once more made his insidious gesture. Again the lightning flashed but this time upon a scene not wholly strange. It was Greenwich, the Greenwich that used to be, with here and there a roof or row of houses as we see it now, yet with lovely green lanes and fields and bits of grassy common. The marsh still glittered beyond, but in the farther distance I saw the steeples of what was then all of New York, Trinity and St. Paul's and the brick church dominating their sisters, and a faint haze of wood smoke hovering over the whole. I breathed hard, but not so much from the sight itself as from the possibilities my imagination terrifiedly conjured up. Can you dare you go far? I spoke with awe, and I think he shared it for a second, but the evil grin returned. Far. What I have seen would blast ye to a mad statue of stone. Back, back forward, forward look, ye puling lackwit. And as he snarled the phrase under his breath he gestured anew, bringing to the sky a flash more blinding than either which had come before. For full three seconds I could glimpse that pandemoniac sight, and in those seconds I saw a vista which will ever afterward torment me in dreams. I saw the heavens verminous with strange flying things, and beneath them a hellish black city of giant stone terraces with impious pyramids flung savagely to the moon, and devil lights burning from unnumbered windows. And swarming loathsomely on aerial galleries I saw the yellow, squint-eyed people of that city, robed horribly in orange and red, and dancing insanely to the pounding of fevered kettle drums, the clatter of obscene crotala, and the maniacal moaning of muted horns whose ceaseless dirges rose and fell undulantly like the waves of an unhallowed ocean of bitumen. I saw this vista, I say, and heard as with the mind's ear the blasphemous Dom Daniel of Cacophony which companioned it. It was the shrieking fulfillment of all the horror which that corp city had ever stirred in my soul, and forgetting every injunction to silence I screamed and screamed and screamed as my nerves gave way and the walls quivered about me. Then, as the flash subsided, I saw that my host was trembling too, a look of shocking fear half blotting from his face the serpent distortion of rage which my screams had excited. He tottered, clutched at the curtains as I had done before, and wriggled his head wildly, like a hunted animal. God knows he had cause, for as the echoes of my screaming died away there came another sound so hellishly suggestive that only numbed emotion kept me sane and conscious. It was the steady, stealthy creaking of the stairs beyond the locked door, as with the ascent of a barefoot or skin-shot horde, and at last the cautious, purposeful rattling of the brass latch that glowed in the feeble candlelight. The old man clawed and spat at me through the moldy air, and barked things in his throat as he swayed with the yellow curtain he clutched. The full moon damn ye ye, ye yelping dog ye called dem, and they've come for me. Moccasin feet dead men gad sink ye, ye red devils, but I poison no rum oh, yours haunt I kept your pox rotted magic safe, ye swillied yourselves sick, curse ye, and ye must needs blame the squire let go, you. Unhand that latch iv not for ye here. At this point three slow and very deliberate raps shook the panels of the door, and a white foam gathered at the mouth of the frantic magician. His fright, turning to steely despair, left room for a resurgence of his rage against me, and he staggered a step toward the table on whose edge I was steadying myself. The curtains, still clutched in his right hand as his left clawed out at me, 
grew taut and finally crashed down from their lofty fastenings, admitting to the room a flood of that full moonlight which the brightening of the sky had presaged. In those greenish beams the candles paled, and a new semblance of decay spread over the musk-reeking room with its wormy paneling, sagging floor, battered mantle, rickety furniture, and ragged draperies. It spread over the old man, too, whether from the same source or because of his fear and vehemence, and I saw him shrivel and blacken as he lurched near and strove to rend me with vulturine talons. Only his eyes stayed whole, and they glared with a propulsive, dilated incandescence which grew as the face around them charred and dwindled. The rapping was now repeated with greater insistence, and this time bore a hint of metal. The black thing facing me had become only a head with eyes, impotently trying to wriggle across the sinking floor in my direction, and occasionally emitting feeble little spits of immortal malice. Now swift and splintering blows assailed the sickly panels, and I saw the gleam of a tomahawk as it cleft the rending wood. I did not move, for I could not, but watched dazedly as the door fell in pieces to admit a colossal, shapeless influx of inky substance starred with shining, malevolent eyes. It poured thickly, like a flood of oil bursting a rotten bulkhead, overturned a chair as it spread, and finally flowed under the table and across the room to where the blackened head with the eyes still glared at me. Around that head it closed, totally swallowing it up, and in another moment it had begun to recede, bearing away its invisible burden without touching me, and flowing again out of that black doorway and down the unseen stairs, which creaked as before, though in reverse order. Then the floor gave way at last, and I slid gaspingly down into the night chamber below, choking with cobwebs and half swooning with terror. The green moon, shining through broken windows, showed me the hall door half open, and as I rose from the plaster-strewn floor and twisted myself free from the sagged ceiling, I saw sweep past it an awful torrent of blackness, with scores of baleful eyes glowing in it. It was seeking the door to the cellar, and when it found it, it vanished therein. I now felt the floor of this lower room giving as that of the upper chamber had done, and once a crashing above had been followed by the fall past the west window of something which must have been the cupola. Now liberated for the instant from the wreckage, I rushed through the hall to the front door, and finding myself unable to open it, seized a chair and broke a window, climbing frenziedly out upon the unkempt lawn where moonlight danced over yard-high grass and weeds. The wall was high, and all the gates were locked, but moving a pile of boxes in a corner I managed to gain the top and cling to the great stone urn set there. About me in my exhaustion I could see only strange walls and windows and old gambrel roofs. The steep street of my approach was nowhere visible, and the little I did see succumbed rapidly to a mist that rolled in from the river despite the glaring moonlight. Suddenly the urn to which I clung began to tremble, as if sharing my own lethal dizziness, and in another instant my body was plunging downward to I knew not what fate. The man who found me said that I must have crawled a long way despite my broken bones, for a trail of blood stretched off as far as he dared look. The gathering rain soon effaced this link with the scene of my ordeal, and reports could state no more than that I had appeared from a place unknown, at the entrance of a little black court off Perry Street. I never sought to return to those tenebrous labyrinths, nor would I direct any sane man thither if I could. Of who or what that ancient creature was, I have no idea, but I repeat that the city is dead and full of unsuspected horrors. Whither he has gone, I do not know, but I have gone home to the pure New England lanes up which fragrant sea winds sweep at evening. I've always been a fan of horror. I binged scary movies, listened to podcasts, watched true crime, etc. I like to believe that because of my interest in true crime, I was untouchable. I thought listening to a podcast would make me more aware of my surroundings, which I suppose it did. However, I never would have thought I would have my own encounter. Eight months ago the most terrifying moment of my life occurred in my very own home. For some context, I'm about to be a sophomore in high school and at the time of this story I was a freshman. I wanted to fit in at school so I was very social and friendly with everyone. Over time I became close with a boy, 
we'll call John, and he introduced me to his friend group. Everyone was funny and goofy and we had lots of laughs together. We all sat by the district building every day for lunch and would mess around. I became very close friends with the people in this group and was introduced to a lot of peers I'd never noticed before. This is how I met Anthony. I'd always seen him around school but never really noticed him. He's one of those stereotypical popular boys who play football and have girls fawning over him. I've never been interested in guys like that and they've never been interested in me so that was that. He started getting close with John so he began hanging around with us at lunch. I started to get to know him more as he would talk to me almost all of lunch. I didn't find it that strange since I would talk to everyone, so you can imagine my shock when he asked if he could have my phone number. I let him know that I wasn't interested in him that way and he sort of laughed saying how he just wanted to get to know me more as friends. I didn't see any red flags so I gave him my phone number. A few days went by with no message and I forgot about the whole thing. One night I was scrolling on Reddit when I got a message from an unknown number. I opened it and it read, Hey Bella, it's Anthony, I answered and we started goofing around with random memes, funny videos, overall just having a fun time. He sent me a video of him goofing around and jumping in his room. I didn't find this unusual as me and my friends would send videos like that all the time. I sent one back of me playing something on the piano and making a joke after I finished. It was getting late and I had to turn the phone down at 10 on school nights. I went to sleep and didn't say goodnight to him or end the conversation. I'm a really deep sleeper so I didn't wake up until the morning when my alarm went off. I shut off the alarm and saw I had three missed texts from Anthony. I opened the messages and it was three videos. The first was of him strumming terribly on the guitar which I actually laughed from. The second was about a minute long of him walking without saying a word. It was just a video of his feet on the ground. I found that odd and clicked on the next video. He was in LED lighting set on the same color mine were on which I thought was a cool coincidence. He said something funny and I began to laugh a little when he moved his head slightly. I paused the video a bit confused because in the background I saw my wallpaper. I got this wallpaper from my grandmother in England so I was wondering how he could possibly have the same one. I kept playing the video and he turned the camera toward the other end of his bed, except I saw my room. Sitting next to him on the bed was my sleeping body. He was in my bed. He started reaching his hand out centimeters away from my body and waved it all around me. I felt sick. A terror washed over me that I had never felt before. I was frozen in place, my eyes wide open. My heart was beating so hard I thought it would burst out of my chest. A million questions ran through my mind. I kept wondering how the hell he got my address. How did he get into my house? Why would he want to break into my room? And worst of all, how did I not wake up? The idea that a psychopath could be next to me in my own bed without me having any clue terrified me. I felt a kind of dread I've never experienced before. I immediately blocked him and saved the video. I ran to my mom crying my eyes out and explained everything. I showed her the video and she turned red with rage. My mom and dad took my phone and went through all the messages he sent. At no point had I given him my address or even spoke about where I live. My mom went to the police station and my dad stayed at home with me trying to calm me down. I was inconsolable. I had never felt fear like this before. I was so violated and exposed without even knowing it. I thought I could trust that my body would alert me of danger but it didn't. I couldn't even rely on my own body to keep me safe. I had to go in for questioning and discuss every conversation I'd ever had with him. Apparently he admitted to everything after being shown the video. He was charged with breaking and entering and taken into a juvenile facility. I'm still in therapy 8 months later and switched schools. I haven't spoken to anyone from my old school since this event. It's impossible for me to trust anyone now. We're moving houses in a few days which will hopefully help me with feeling safer. I just don't think I can live normally in this house anymore. 
I just hope Anthony doesn't hurt anyone else ever again. About two years ago was a real rough patch for me. Due to a lot of personal issues I was struggling with my sleep and suffered from sleep paralysis, lucid dreams, and other events I can't really explain. I would wake up in the night unable to move with this horrible feeling of dread and terror. Sometimes I would see things in the corner of my room or standing over me. The worst was a girl with sharp pointy teeth hovering over me while I laid unable to move. However, the event I will be retelling is one I simply cannot explain. Every morning I would wake up early for school and fall back asleep on the couch after I got dressed and ready to leave the house. Usually I would get an extra 20 minutes or so before my dad would wake me up and off we went. I never ate breakfast in the morning as it made me feel nauseous. One morning like any other I was asleep on the couch. For context, the couch I was asleep on faced towards the kitchen slash dining room area and my parents room was down the hall to the left of the living area. As I drifted to sleep my vision shifted to the corner ceiling of the living room. I could see myself sleeping on the couch as well as the kitchen slash dining room. I saw my dad walk across to the kitchen to tell me, good morning, and start making me breakfast. Like I said before, I didn't eat breakfast which is why it was so strange of my dad to make me some. I woke up a few minutes later and my dad was still in his room. A few days went by and I got a good night's sleep so I was just sitting on the couch watching TV. I heard my dad leave his room and he walked across the living room and said, good morning, to me and continued to make me breakfast exactly as I had seen in my dream. I felt sick to my stomach and scared out of my mind. I don't understand how I could have known every detail of an interaction that hadn't happened yet. If anyone has an explanation of this event I'd love to hear it. I have many more stories of my strange sleeping occurrences so let me know if I should give updates about that. I've never been able to fully comprehend what happened that morning. Every summer my family and I venture north for several weeks, as do most other families in my state. The town we visited was not far from another sprawling town on a lake. Despite my overall disdain for most people and traffic, the area was pleasant most of the time. Additionally, two friends of mine also visited the area and we would meet with each other at least two or three days out of the two weeks I was there. The names of my friends are OSI and Jack and we are all the same age and live in the same town back home so we know one another quite well. Anyway, one evening when I rode my bike over to the general store where we would all meet, only Jack was there. For context, Jack is always 5 to 10 minutes late and OSI was always there at least 20 minutes before me, seeing as though he could just walk from where his family's cabin was to the store, so this took me slightly by surprise. So I asked Jack where OSI was and he said. Didn't you get the message? He said he found something and was going to take a while before he got back. I was confused when he had stated this as I did not remember getting a message from our group chat, but sure enough, when I opened my messages there was one that wasn't opened. The message read something along the lines of, I'm going to be a little late, I found something really cool. So me and Jack waited about an hour in front of the store waiting for OSI when he finally showed up but he didn't have his bike, which I found downright weird seeing as though he cherished that thing. Before we could say anything to OSI he immediately said. You guys have to check out this building I found, come on let's go. I asked him where his bike was and he just responded with. It's back at my cabin, you probably want to leave your bikes here if you want to get to the place I found. So we obliged and chained our bikes to a lamppost. We followed OSI down the main road until we came up to a gravel side street with a no outlet sign. OSI pointed at the gravel road and said. Down here, it's going to be past the end of the road so expect some hiking. When we came onto the gravel road I noticed nearly instantly that there were very few homes on this road, which was bizarre for such a well-populated area at the time of year we were visiting. About a quarter of the way down this decrepit and unkempt road, at least by OSI's measurement, Jack asked what this building was that OSI had found and OSI responded by saying it was an abandoned and odd-looking grey brick building with a metal roof shaped like a half-circle, similar to a greenhouse. 
I asked if he had entered the building yet and OSI said that he tried the front door but it got stuck on something. After OSI had said this Jack asked if OSI knew for certain that this building was abandoned and OSI responded by saying that some of the windows were broken and the entire back end of the house next to it was destroyed. After OSI had mentioned this we all agreed that if we can get into this facility we can make it a hideout where OSI and Jack could smoke, seeing as though I don't but I thought it would be fun to have that sort of thing nonetheless. After about another hour of walking, we finally reached the end of the road. At this point it was 7 o'clock in the evening and it was becoming noticeably darker under the canopy of trees on this essentially destitute road so I was beginning to have second thoughts but I kept my mouth shut because OSI wasn't the best person to argue with if you catch my meaning. So we proceeded into the woods for what I could guess was about a mile when we stumbled into a clearing with a big bungalow style house and the building that OSI described to us to the left of it. We waited for, give or take, three minutes to see if the coast was clear and then made our way to the building. OSI's discernment almost precisely fit the appearance of the facility, it was roughly ten feet tall with a curved roof made with sheet steel not unlike what you would find on barns or utility sheds. OSI was now excited and when he went up to the door he motioned for us to help him open it, so that is just what we did, and to this day I regret ever going anywhere near that clearing. We opened the door with relative ease, but what came next was completely unexpected. Something fell from the table blocking the door and it sounded vaguely wet and when OSI had shined his flashlight in the general direction of where the sound occurred we saw, and I am not joking, a severed alligator head with strings of flesh and muscle still attached. At about this time the smell of the interior hit all of us and I vomited with OSI and Jack proceeding to gag. Mind you, we were in a place nowhere near a natural habitat for alligators, about a thousand miles to be more exact so this was beyond weird to just find the head one laying in a building on the other side of the continent. OSI, being as stubborn as ever, shined his light even further into the building and all we saw were pieces of various reptiles all over the place. We had also seen syringes and vats on long tables, along with blood smeared across most of the surfaces that weren't covered with a multitude of reptile parts. At the moment we opted to get out of there Jack whispered. What the fuck? At this, OSI and I turned to where Jack was looking and found that one of the lights was on in one of the downstairs rooms of the seemingly abandoned house and someone was walking to the front door. What looked to be a man stepped out and issued a nearly deafening scream that sent us running through the woods back to the road. None of us mentioned what had happened to our parents and it has been five years since this has ensued, not a day passes where I don't think about it. Edit, there have been several complaints pertaining to my lack of elaboration as to what had happened after the events of the story, all I will state here is that roughly two or so weeks after this had occurred did we, or I did, at least, reveal to our parents what happened that night. I had only done so as my parents can be rather stringent at times and I did not wish to be punished for something that was otherwise a freak and arbitrary mistake. Additionally, Someone within the comments posted two links to the general area of where me and my friends were, it may be the place we were, but again I do not precisely remember where the facility and house were in the forest. This story still haunts me to this day. This takes place around 10 years ago when I was like 8 or 9. I lived in a pretty shitty neighborhood in what was at the time a really run-down city. It wasn't good but it wasn't bad at the same time, just a few bad apples in the tree. Anyways, enough background on the neighborhood, now on to the main story. My friends and I loved to play outside. It was the only thing we could do. No one in the neighborhood could afford any sort of electronics or any sort of fun machine to play with. We loved to just run through people's yards, cutting through houses, if they just so happened to leave their door open. Now looking back on it, it is probably the dumbest thing kids our age could have been doing in a neighborhood like that. This story has nothing to do with running in people's houses, just wanted to let you know how dumb of kids we were. Well on one fateful day, we were playing hide and seek with four of us hiders and one of us a seeker. We thought it would have been a funny idea to go to the other side of the neighborhood, so that the seeker could never find us and we'd win. We liked to call that part of the neighborhood the rich part, 
because they had two-story houses over there and a forest with a creek in it. We were just doing our usual thing, cutting through people's yards and jumping fences, when we heard the loudest scream maybe four to five houses down. After hopping off the fence that we had just jumped, we all stopped and looked around wondering where it came from. I noticed that one of our hiders weren't with us anymore. Three of us left. Where's Isaac? I exclaimed. We heard the scream again. I pointed towards where the sound came from and we all jumped back over the fence we just jumped from and ran towards the scream. When we thought we got to the spot where the screaming was coming from, there was nothing there but an empty plot of land and the forest. We all started to get scared. Did Isaac get lost in the forest? Did he get taken back there? Then we heard the scream again. It was definitely Isaac. I decided to be the man of all the other eight-year-olds and go into the forest to make sure Isaac was okay. As I started my way into the trees, I did one last look at my friends and saw how horrified their faces were. I knew at the moment that I was definitely the only one that could go down into the forest. Making my way in, I could feel all the heat in my body fading and some sort of dread starting to take over. As I walked further in it started getting darker, and harder to see. I was whisper yelling my friend's name. He responded in the most shaken up voice down here. Be quiet. I finally got to him and asked him what happened. He told me this story of how he got tired of running and decided to take a break on the curb to catch his breath, and that instead of being out in the open and risking the chance of being caught, he decided to go into the woods and hide. He said that after like five minutes after he sat down he heard talking, nothing that he could make out. Just random nonsense. He looked around to see a man in a black hoodie hiding behind a tree on the other side of the creek staring at him. But the man took off before my friend could even get up to run away. And this is where he said he started screaming at the top of his lungs, and hid somewhere else in the forest. Which is where both of us are now hiding. And I kid you not as soon as he told me this, we heard a twig snap. We both look up to see the man looking for us in some of the shrubbery on the forest floor. I couldn't make out any facial expressions or anything on his face for a matter of fact. I could see he was holding some sort of blade, I couldn't tell if it was a stick or a machete. All I knew is that we needed to run. So when he turned his back we got up and started running. We didn't care how loud we were, we just knew that we needed to run. We got out of the forest and told all of our friends to run as fast as they could down the street. We kept running until we got to the other side of the block and we all turned around to see the street empty. No one. Not a single car. And from a distance you could hear a roar, or like a very loud engine. Shortly after that initial roar a silver 2000s Mustang with the darkest windows comes peeling around the corner faster than I've ever seen a car go, headed straight towards us. I've never had my body tighten up like it had at that very moment when I knew it was the same guy from the forest. I told all my friends to split up and run into people's yards to hide. So as we were all hiding and running through alleyways and jumping fences you can still hear his engine. It was like he was targeting only me. I can't even tell you how far I ran. I got to the point where I didn't even think I was in my neighborhood, but still I hear his engine coming up on me. So I ran more. I was exhausted, the sun finally started to set and I could hear his engine fade. Almost like he had forgotten about me, or just had given up. I start making my way back home scared shitless. Checking my back every so often to make sure I wasn't being followed. Once I made it home, I went right to bed to cry myself to sleep. And for months after that, that 2000 silver Mustang would follow us, stalking every corner that we played on. We'd see it at our school, at the grocery store. Hell it could have been a coincidence that our little minds are now perceiving things around us, but either way I think he was stalking us. Nothing actually came of him following us, he never did what he did that first day, but it was still so scary seeing that car everywhere we went. I didn't know what to or how to tell my mom. So I didn't. And still haven't. This story is for the people of this sub and my four other friends. 
Funny enough the seeker didn't know what happened until the day after when we were at school and we told him. He still doesn't believe us and says it was to go inside and have him looking for us all night lol. So to the man that decided to chase a group of 8 to 9 year olds in his silver Mustang. Let's never meet again.